captain's log, stardate 11601.29, assignment Earth. A mysterious object from a Class M planet in the Alpha Quadrant is being transported by shuttlecraft. An interstellar time traveler, it brings a message of hope to all humanoid species. What's inside this crate is taking us where no man or woman has gone before. Because this is Captain Kirk's command chair. That's right, the original prop chair from the bridge of the original groundbreaking series. Mr. Chekhov, resume original course, warp factor two. Warp factor two, sir. Manager. 50 years after the first voyage of the Starship Enterprise, Star Trek is a pop culture phenomenon that changed the course of history. It was just a kissing scene. Faces on stun. Star Trek is part of our cultural DNA. With the coolest props. This is a tricorder. And mind-blowing science. Our playbook is basically the first season of Star Trek. Character Enterprise. It invented the world in which we live. We're making the Star Trek universe happen. And 50 years off, Star Trek is still inventing the future. Explore strange new worlds. Fascinating. It began on September 8th, 1966. Created by Gene Roddenberry, the original series of Star Trek has inspired another six TV series and 13 feature films, including the latest in the rebooted franchise. Really want to head back out there, huh? Carl Urban plays the new Bones McCoy. Part of what was so appealing about Star Trek back then is what is appealing about it today. Dazzling display of logic. You didn't think I had it in me, did you, Spock? No, sir. It's about this family, this dysfunctional family in space that don't always get on but have to work together. I like them better than I like you. Simon Pegg is co-writer of Star Trek Beyond and the new Scotty. Star Trek is the one shining light which says, no, we're not going to destroy ourselves. We're going to continue and we're going to move out into the galaxy and be really handsome. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> For the scriptwriters of the original series, it began as a sci-fi fantasy. We were making it up as we went along. <laughs> I think it was just imagination at the time and conjecture. Just, uh, well, this could happen. This could be a good idea. And everybody was saying, well, what will we do in the 23rd century? How will it look? What it would... And so they were, they were having this great time inventing the 23rd century. And this insane torture chamber. But for a generation of scientists who grew up watching the reruns, it's provided a blueprint for the future. as they unlock the secrets of warp space and teleportation, reveal the mysteries of the invisibility cloak, and solve the riddle of the phaser and tricorder. And it's really about sort of not just hoping for the future, but making the future happen. What inspired these scientific breakthroughs can be found here at the EMP Museum of Pop Culture in Seattle. Wow. Fans are getting the chance to get up close and personal with authentic props from the original series. Gathered together in the same place for the first time in nearly half a century. Oh, this is fabulous. The objects from Star Trek are national treasures now. They are cultural icons. This is amazing. The navigation console of Mr. Sulu and Mr. Chekhov. Lieutenant Uhura's earpiece. 
Dr. McCoy's tricorder, Mr. Spock's tunic, the phaser, the communicator, and at the heart of it all, the mother of all iconic props. This is Captain Kirk's command chair. This is Captain James Kirk of the USS Enterprise. This is, this is the heart of it all. This is where Kirk sits and guides his ship, guides his crew. Staying with us. Faces down evil aliens. <laughs> Seduces pretty women. <laughs> um, his relationship with women was something that I wouldn't always expect to be what happens with a captain. This super brash, super confident, cocky. I want some answers to all this. Rebel, who everyone just loves because he's just a little bit naughty. Suave, brilliant. Not only do we have your psychokinetic ability, but at twice your power level. Uh, go with his gut. That settles that. Great leader. You won't get it through torture. Driven beyond belief. I want that third alternative. Most people who want to play Star Trek when they're 10 years old want to be Captain Kirk. It just seems like the best job. Kirk's chair is your typical piece of 1950s office furniture with a few added lights and buttons. But it sold at auction in 2002 for more than $300,000. Of course, that 11-year-old Brooks that watched Star Trek as a kid, I would love to see what it feels like to really sit in that chair. Tempting, isn't it? I never, ever will. Uh, it's an object that we have to protect. We are the stewards of this chair. And so, no sitting. From the comfort of this command chair, Captain Kirk can give an order like, John Sulu, activate track of mute. And hey presto, an invisible beam of energy called a tractor beam grabs hold of any passing object in space and pulls it along like an interstellar tow truck. We love tractor beams, although you never saw a beam in the original show because they couldn't afford to put a beam. <laughs> Turn on the tractor beam and then and, and, and the thing would somehow follow along. Okay, so there's some light, but not Physics light. professor David Greer is making his own tractor beam in his lab at New York University using beams of light in the form of high energy lasers. We've seen it on TV, right? Uh, but can you imagine doing it for real? Okay, so here's the wave. Then you have a tractor beam. Having figured out the equation for a tractor beam. David can go back to the lab and use his lasers to grab hold of tiny particles of matter. What you're seeing right here is going on in the optical table uh, right now. It's happening live. We are actually manipulating objects. We're moving them around with the forces exerted by light. What you're seeing on the screen is just a millionth of a meter, way smaller than a Star Trek shuttlecraft. To give you a sense of the scale, uh, this TV screen here um, is about one quarter the size of a human hair. It may be tiny, but this is a scientific first. It's just amazing that it works. From the, uh, from the equations to the TV screen. Block? Okay, so check. And in 10 years time, David wants to put his tractor beam into outer space. One application, early application for tractor beams would be to put it on the space station, beam it into space, and just keep pulling back the material, keep analyzing it, keep pulling back. It's, it's a, uh, a fishing net of light. It's a tractor beam. But Star Trek wasn't just pushing the boundaries of science. The challenge with Star Trek was to rattle the bars of the cage, was to push the limit and it would change the course of history with a kiss. But coming up first, set phasers to stun. Star Trek on a battlefield near you. At the official Star Trek convention in Las Vegas, the fans are getting excited 
for the 50th anniversary. They love the show and they just can't get enough. But there's no bigger fan than this guy. Meet Gerald Gurian, who's built the bridge of the Starship Enterprise in his living room. Step right this way, bro. Look at this. This is fantastic. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> Very cool. And guess what Gerald's got? It's one of the rarest props of them all, an original phaser from the original series. It's a light. Yes, you know, as a, as a it, kid, you always imagine it's got this weight. It's, it's really hollow weird. fiberglass. This is really mind-blowing, because as far as we know, there are only two phasers in existence. It's something I've wanted to do since I was 10, you know, it was like, hold a phaser. That was really hard to, like, keep it cool and be all professional, you know, like, yeah, yeah, when I was just, there's this nine-year-old kid in me going, oh my goodness, the phaser. Star Trek's phaser is like a souped-up version of the ordinary laser, which was invented in the 1960s. Today, in Lockheed Martin's research lab in Bothell, Washington, scientists are developing lasers more powerful than ever before, and their goal is to create a phaser for real. So how could we actually make a phaser? Well, when I look at a device like this, the first thing I think about is the energy, the power that's required to get the phaser effect. The next breakthrough would come from being able to, to store enough energy in a device like this so that you could project that beam and get your effect. And how close is Lockheed Martin to achieving this? Well, take a sneak peek. You see the rocket launch. At this point, the laser weapon system has to acquire the rocket, track it, put the high energy laser beam onto it. And that white spot there is an actual reflection of the high energy laser beam on the rocket, overheating the warhead, causing it to explode. Before Rob came along, the energy required to do this required a generator the size of this, or even this, making it as nimble as your average Star Trek alien. And now, Rob's lasers are how big? As you can see, the complete laser weapon system is able to be carried on the back of a flatbed truck. But do scientists believe there could one day be a handheld phaser, like in the TV series? And of course, it's very difficult to predict the future, but I would never bet against science. And it won't be long before Rob's phaser will go from the test range to the battlefield. The phaser, like all the props in the original series of Star Trek, was designed to be cheap and cheerful. Close that door. The props were always a problem. Most of them were just wooden things slapped together at the last minute. Plastic, uh, little bits of metal, whatever that could look good on screen and function in a certain way. Internal injuries. And because it was a cheap show, the scriptwriters had to come up with ingenious ways of making it look like cool science. 70% kidney failure. Energize including the most outrageous science fiction invention of them all, the transporter. A little scary when you think about it, having all your molecules turned into energy and shot down this ray to millions of miles away. And you've got to trust that that's going to work. I mean, we put our trust in something which basically minces you. As a narrative device, it's brilliant because you can go from one place to the next very, very quickly. And it's a genius piece of uh, inventive writing and also feels very science fiction, you know, the matter transfer. But in Star Trek, you buy it because it's the future and things like that exist in the future. Actually, the future is now. Because NASA already has a transporter, thanks to its very own science officer, Francesco Marsili. But there's one big difference from Star Trek. We are not teleporting Captain Kirk because the teleportation uh, shown uh, 
in Star Trek transfers matter. When the detector switches from What the Francesco can teleport is the state of a photon using one of these, a photon detector. A photon is a subatomic particle of light. If you can change the state of one photon, you can change the state of another, even if it's miles away. Einstein called it spooky action at a distance, which is what he actually is. Think of it like a color. Francesco can teleport the color of one photon to another without any transfer of matter. It's called quantum teleportation. And in future missions, NASA plans to use it to communicate in deep space. Fascinating. And yes, Francesco does have a little scientific crush on you know who. Bach. Have a blip on the motion sensor, Captain. The reason why I like him is because of the, the Vulcans. They are advanced, they're a logical mind. Lost them, Captain. The odds against you and I both being killed are 2,228.7 to 1. It's like the perfect scientist. Speed, Mr. Chekhov. We're moving at warp eight. New course. We love the show because we love the characters. Aye, sir. The more time that, you know, you spend with these characters, uh, the more you care for them. Even the breathtaking Enterprise herself. Ever wonder where she ended up after all these years? We'll get up close and personal with her later on. But coming up next, Star Trek's Universal Translator on your very own smartphone. Explore strange new worlds. It may have had shaky special effects, and it may have had makeshift props, but the world created by Star Trek was utterly convincing. Captain, we're getting a signal from the spacecraft. When you watched it as a fan, you never questioned it. You just, you bought it. It was, your suspension of disbelief was complete. You were like, yeah, fine. So this is a communicator. This is one of the actual props. It was probably used by everyone on the show at one point or another. Enterprise to Captain Kirk. Come in, please. Kirk, yeah, what is it, Enterprise? These guys are using little communicator devices, and you know, you, you have a look at today, and most of us are walking around with these smartphones. That can do all of that. Back to Enterprise. Enterprise here. But Star Trek didn't only invent the flip phone. It imagined a world of wireless Bluetooth technology. I'm getting no signal from it, sir. This is one of the funkier pieces of Star Trek design. It has a real 60s look about it. Contact established, Captain. Unlike so many TV props, which when you look up close, you say, oh, I can tell this is a prop. This is cool technology all the way down. It, it never stops looking completely real and completely convincing. Hailing frequencies open, sir. Hailing frequencies open, Captain. I'm Nichelle Nichols, and I played Lieutenant Uhura in Star Trek. Well, she's the most important person on the bridge. When Lieutenant Uhura says, Captain, everybody turns around to look. You cannot help but fall in love with her. <laughs> Starfleet Command extends greetings to Commissioner... She Beale even had a groundbreaking love scene with none other than Captain Kirk himself. I would see you so busy at your command. This is a very important episode in both Star Trek history and television history, because in it, Captain Kirk, William Shatner, kisses Lieutenant Uhura. And this is one of the first, most famous interracial kisses on TV. And at the time in the 60s, this was considered a very big deal. It was just a kissing scene. In fact, some US television affiliates even refused to air this episode at the time. Remember, this wasn't really the 23rd century. It was the 1960s, at the height of the civil rights movement and the struggle for racial equality. Security sweeps of all decks are negative, Mr. Spock. No evidence of- African Americans saw the show and went, what? You know, like, we're on TV. She presented a totally out of the box 
opportunity for us to think, hey, that might be possible. Analysis sector. Channel one. Romance, main politics, and science. Star Trek had it all. Plus, its fair share of interstellar conflict. We are on a peaceful mission in this part of the galaxy. We have no hostile intentions. Resolving conflict through communication was at the heart of the Star Trek vision. And it simply translates its findings into English. And they did this using the universal translator, a handy device, especially if you don't like reading subtitles. We wish to talk to you. That you can speak to anybody in the galaxy because you have this thing. And you don't really question what, how it works, or, and it's not your position or place to know how it works. You're not a scientist, you're a television watcher. Behind the shiny plate glass windows of Google HQ is today's universal translator. Would you like to in order, order to translate this, coffee with sugar, but no milk, please. Google's computers have been scanning the web for every document that has been translated, learning over a hundred languages, so you can order a skinny shot latte in Russian. Companion, try to understand. Our goal is to just, like in Star Trek, just speak freely and uh, the mobile phone, Google Translate, identifies, automatically identifies the language you speak. Working. But Google can now do more than just voice recognition. It can enable your smartphone to read different languages. Explore strange new worlds. What I really want to do is I want to make a window into a world that's in your language. So you can take your phone, you can hold it up, and just wherever you point it, everything is in your language. I'll uh, first choose a language, uh, choose Russian to English, click the camera, and see what this says. Five-year mission. Over 100 billion words a day are being translated in the blink of an eye. That takes a couple milliseconds. But not as fast as warp speed, just yet. To boldly go where before was not a single person. <laughs> and it seems that whether you're on Alpha Centauri or planet Earth, there is just one universal language. Across all languages, the top three translated uh, phrases are thank you, how are you, and I love you. We can speak the same language or a different language with one another. We're human beings, and we're proud of it. I know I am. Star Trek's vision of hope is part of its enduring appeal. It was bright and vibrant and sexy and full of action and had an instant appeal to it. Not least, sex appeal. Um, let's check out. Coming up, the secret archive that reveals Mr. Spock, the man, not the Vulcan. But first, the holy grail for true Star Trek fans. Get ready to meet the Starship Enterprise herself. In the days before computer animation, a model of the Enterprise was used to film shots like these. As it turned on a gimbal, the camera passed by on a track, as though the model was traveling through space. Is it beautiful? It's absolutely beautiful. It's an amazing object. I love the ship. Fire all phases. But the show was canceled after just three seasons and the model was donated to the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C., where it's been on and off display ever since. The museum entrance is already packed to the rafters with iconic artifacts. There's the Spirit of St. Louis, Sputnik, and the Apollo Lunar Module. But Smithsonian curator Margaret Weidekamp thinks it's still one starship short of a Starfleet. I'm a fan. I love Star Trek. If we could have one object 
that tells the story of imagination and inspiration that's so important to space flight, to real space flight. It's got to be the Starship Enterprise. Wow. The model is currently in the conservation lab. That's beautiful. <laughs> Margaret has recruited her own Star Trek brain trust. A team of technical wizards who have worked on dozens of Star Trek feature films and series to help preserve it for future generations. As soon as we walk into the room, I could see that this was going to come together. And the excitement in the group was really just electric. You see this model there, you're like, oh my gosh, it's beautiful. Because remember, its function is to be beautiful. Its function is not to fly. Its function is to be attractive in the movie context. <laughs> the model is three and a half meters long and weighs around 90 kilograms. It's made out of wood, molded plastic, and sheet metal. All of it glued and screwed together. It's made out of uh, old automobile uh, lights doing the lighting, the Christmas tree lights doing the blinky thing. But after 50 years, yeah, it's now in danger of concern. falling apart. You can see the load from the weight of the, uh, the engine nacelle dropping down has caused the wooden glue joint here to separate. So the fact that this crack is running across here is the biggest fear that I have is that, you know, this entire hull section could just split open like an egg. If you see this area here, you've got some more of this flaking paint. The paint through here is just literally cleaving off in these large chips. Red alert. So, in a race to get her ready in time for her 50th birthday, the model is being taken apart, probed, painted, and polished. The Star Trek Enterprise model is receiving the same standards of care that we would give to any artifact in the museum's collection. And when she's finished, she'll take pride of place next to the Apollo Lunar Module. Many people don't realize that the Star Trek Starship Enterprise filming model and the Apollo Lunar Module are contemporaneous spacecraft. So they were both built in the 1960s during a period of time where fictional space exploration is becoming reality. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Star Trek was the dream, but the Apollo mission was the reality. And when Neil Armstrong landed on the moon, I mean, I, I wasn't the only one. There were a lot of us in tears of joy. Three, two, one, fire. We have ignition of NASA's space launch system. Five seconds. Today, NASA's goal is to send astronauts to Mars. And it's testing the biggest rocket ever built, the Space Launch System which is 34 times more powerful than a jumbo jet on full throttle. Of course, the Enterprise didn't need rockets because it had warp drive. Resume original course, warp factor two. Warp factor two, sir. It's like when you put your car into sport mode, and drive really fast. I don't particularly understand it, and I, I'm in charge of the engine room at the moment. It just means you go fast, and that's all you need to know. <laughs> go to warp six. But could we ever travel at warp speed for real? According to Einstein, nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. But if you could warp space-time, you could get from here to there not just fast, but instantaneously. And one way of doing that might be to use gravitational waves. Einstein himself predicted their existence a hundred years ago. And today, at the LIGO Observatory in Louisiana, they're detecting them for the very first time. It's a worldwide collaboration of more than a thousand scientists and engineers, including operations manager Richard Oram, who, when he's not making the scientific discovery of the century, likes to watch reruns of Star Trek. 
I've watched all of them multiple times, at least four or five times. But I've never considered myself to be a Trekkie. But I'm beginning to realize that perhaps I might be. Richard is LIGO's answer to the Enterprise's chief engineer, Scotty. The ship's not structured to take that speed for any length of time. Ooh, I don't know about that. It's going to take this long when really he can probably do it in a bit shorter, but he's given himself the room to make mistakes. Captain, we can't maintain warp rate speed much longer. Pressures are approaching the critical point range. Richard doesn't have a dilithium crystal matrix, but he does have two four kilometer lasers. And like a giant observatory, they can detect events halfway across the universe. In 2015, they detected the collision of two massive black holes one and a half billion light years away, which created a gravitational wave, which warped space time and was detected right here in Louisiana. We're only really at the very starting point of understanding gravitational waves, but it's not too far-fetched to, you know, from that starting point to think, well, if we can understand them, we can maybe learn how to use them. and maybe one day use them to travel through space and even time. For Star Trek fans, it's a dream encapsulated by the Starship Enterprise. So what will they make of its restoration? There were fans out there who are watching and loving and expecting it to look like what they saw, and they will be very pleased and very happy. And some fans will hate it. Coming up, the big reveal. But first, the cloak of invisibility. From science fiction to science fact. When the model of the Enterprise is ready, it will go on display at the Smithsonian beside two intermediate range nuclear missiles from the Cold War. Which is the kind of real life issue the scriptwriters of Star Trek never shied away from. While the original premise of the show may have been, let's just have some adventures with a spaceship, very quickly it became social commentary as well. Outpost 4 reported under attack, sir. In the episode, the A Balance of Terror, the Enterprise finds itself in Star Trek's version of a 1960s Cold War standoff. Did Outpost 4 give anything at all on the attacking vessel, Lieutenant? No identification, sir. Just as the West distrusted the Soviet Union, at the far end of the galaxy, the Romulans were up to no good. All the villains in Star Trek were proxies for our villains, uh, uh, the real enemies of the time. Those shifty Romulans had a secret weapon, the Romulan Invisibility Cloak. I don't see anything. Visibility is theoretically possible, Captain. Selective bending of light, but the power cost is enormous. Inspired by Star Trek, scientists have been trying to make an invisibility cloak ever since. Obviously, Star Trek is fiction, so we don't, it didn't actually specify how their cloak operated, otherwise we would have built one a long time ago. So Professor John Howell and his team at the University of Rochester have made their own version. They call it the Rochester Cloak. Invisibility is taking a light ray and bending it around an object so that it gets to the observer as if the object weren't there. And you can do this using a simple configuration of four optical lenses. We have the Rochester Cloak, which is four lenses, and they're set apart so that the light that comes in focuses, diverges, comes through, focuses, diverges, and comes through. The Rochester cloak can hide an object, but also make it look transparent so that the whole thing appears as if it's not there. Physics is not magic. It's only magic if you don't understand what's going on. It would be absolutely incredible to an 18th century person to see an iPhone. It would be totally magical. And no one would be more impressed than Mr. Spock himself. 
This is Spock's tunic. This, like all the original series uniforms, it's so important and it's so emblematic of Star Trek and it's really, really precious. In the UCLA Library Special Collections Department, Peggy Alexander is keeper of some of the original fan letters sent to Leonard Nimoy, the actor who played Spock. Leonard Nimoy started getting much more fan mail than the other stars of the show, including William Shatner. Fascinating. The first week, we got a bag of mail, OK. Second week, we got several bags of mail. Third and fourth week, it got coming in so fast and so much, we had to hire a mail service to handle it. Dear Mr. Roddenberry, speaking for many teenage girls here in Virginia, please let Leonard Nimoy, Mr. Spock, do more leading parts. He's sexy. Is Spock sexy? Absolutely. A whole lot of young women thought so. I love Mr. Spock. He's the greatest thing to hit TV. It, when you can't get something, there's an attraction there. <laughs> Please don't change Mr. Spock. He's simultaneously uh, compelling and unavailable. You wouldn't change his personality, would you? I'd probably die if you did. Don't go for the unavailable guys. They're going to break your heart. Um, Spock is always breaking hearts. Today, Spock's original tunic is on display at the EMP Museum's 50th anniversary Star Trek exhibition, together with the iconic props he used. This is a tricorder from Star Trek. This is an original prop. You would have seen this used by Spock, also Dr. McCoy. The tricorder is a, it's a multifunction device. It's a computer, it's a scanner, it's an analyzer, it's a sensor, it's used for science, for medicine, all kinds of things. Uh, it is like an iPad on steroids. It was another brilliant plot device which enabled people to explain things by looking at them. Oh, yeah, that's, this is that. And how does it work exactly? No idea. <laughs> But Peter Diamandis wants to find out. He's founder of the XPRIZE Foundation, which seeks to push the limits of what's scientifically possible. He's offering a $10 million prize to the team that can invent a working tricorder. And this device needs to be something that you can speak to. It's got artificial intelligence on the cloud. And in success, it can diagnose you initially in about you know 15 different diseases as good or better than a board certified doctor. Sonny Coley is a doctor and he grew up in the 70s watching reruns of Star Trek. As I walk into the hospital, the automatic door opens. You know, throw back to Star Trek. I'm walking up the stairs to the ICU. I've been speaking with them with my communicator device, thinking to myself, like, we're already here. These guys saw it coming. A signal, Captain. It's very weak. So it's when hard. Peter says, that should be possible, why don't we have a tricorder? Guess Sonny's reaction. And I was like, come again? <laughs> There's actually a tricorder X Prize competition? And I said, sure, I'd love to sign up. Because who wouldn't want to be the physician of the future? I'll do everything I can, Jim, to save him. I think one of the things that appeals to me the most about him is that he has got the most appalling bedside manner. I don't need I'm still chief medical officer of the Enterprise. I'll tell you what you need and when you need it. But underneath that, he's one of the most altruistic human beings that you can find. And he loves all species. There's nothing disgusting about it. It's just another life form, that's all. Sonny, the 21st century Dr. McCoy, now heads up a team competing with others from around the world in a race to invent a working tricorder. Sonny's tricorder uses an array of sensors to transmit your vital signs to the cloud. There's a future for this, and we're not going to stop until it's out there in the world being used and saving lives. Like any medical diagnostic device, each tricorder must now undergo rigorous clinical testing, 
before a winner can be declared and science fiction can take one step closer to reality. We're making the Star Trek universe happen. It's the most exciting time ever to be alive. How is he? Severe heart damage. Signs of In the space of, of just lungs. 50 years, we've come a long way. If I had known that Star Trek was going to be that big and create that big an impact, I think it would have terrified me. Coming up, where will it take us in the next 50 years? And first, whatever happened to the studio set of the bridge? Three hours, four minutes, sir. Bridge to Captain. That mechanical beast is up here. I've always got it. From science to pop culture, social progress to funky design, Star Trek has led the way. Even though the original series was canceled after just three seasons, and most of the props trashed. Back in 1969, Bill Ward was a grad student at UCLA, and he saw what happened to the studio set of The Bridge. Well, here we are at the back lot of the School of Theater, Film, and Television at UCLA, and I'm retracing the final voyage of the Starship Enterprise. This is where flatbed trucks deposited all of the sets from the original Star Trek. I remember the two sliding doors. They were quite magical in that they seemed to automatically open and close. When I looked at them, I found that there was a handle on each one so that a stagehand could pull it open and close it manually. Captain, we're getting a signal from the spacecraft. I remember Lieutenant Uhura's communication center was a sheet of quarter-inch plywood, also painted gray, with some little things glued to it that didn't really do anything. But she pretended like it did and did quite a good job of that. I think if they had known how valuable this would have become, they would have held on to it because it would be worth a tremendous amount today. Instead of which, the entire structure of quarter-inch plywood flats was taken apart, piece by piece, and over the next decades, cannibalized for student productions. Well, here we are in the School of Theater, Film, and Television scene shop. This is where the Enterprise was finally dismantled. It took several years to do it. It was used in student film production. There might be some pieces of it still here. Who knows? Luckily, the model of the Enterprise wasn't thrown in the dumpster. And 50 years after it first flew across our TV sets, the Starship Enterprise can now be revealed once more in all its restored glory. We know down to the micron that we have the decals in the right places, the uh, windows are exactly right. All of the detailing that makes the Enterprise the Enterprise, we have in the right place. The Enterprise model is a genuine 1960s television star. It shouldn't surprise me, given that this is a model that was built for television, but it just shows up so beautifully on camera. And for Chief Conservator Malcolm Collum, it's a job well done. It's not going to fall apart, at least not in my lifetime. Star Trek may very well outlive us all. The flight machine is on full. Kirk here. And when we were projecting things like the tricorder, the phasers, the transporter, there was a basis in science already that could say, you know, this might happen. This could happen in the future. All of that technology, which was beyond, there's no, you couldn't imagine how to make it at the time. We have that now. And when you realize that uh, the year that Star Trek was supposed to be set in, you know, we're way ahead of schedule. <laughs> That's pretty thrilling. <laughs> Walk Factor 8. Science fiction has played a role of giving a target to shoot for. Explore strange new worlds with what we can do now, with 50 years of technology now. I want to know the rest of the story. 
These are the voyages of the Starship Enterprise. It's five-year mission. To explore strange new worlds. To seek out new life. Innovate civilization. And new civilizations. To boldly go where no man or woman has gone before.